This episode of Hello Monday is brought to you by Delta. Delta flies to 300 cities. That's 300 cities where people sing in the car, poorly. 300 cities where people miss someone in one of the other 299 cities. And Delta isn't flying to those 300 cities merely to bring us together, but to show us we're not that far apart in the first place. Delta, keep climbing. From the editorial team at LinkedIn, I'm Jesse Hempel, and this is Hello Monday, our show about the changing nature of work and how that work is changing us. Every once in a while, when the grind gets to feeling like just too much, my wife tells me that she's going to quit her job. I should, too. We'll move out of the city. She'll carve wooden spoons. All right. Somehow, we'll make a living out of it. You maybe have some version of this yourself. And for most of us, it feels like a fantasy. But then you meet someone who just nails it, goes for it. My guests this week are Matthew Swanson and Robbie Bear. They write children's books, books that maybe your kids have read. Matthew does the words, Robbie does the pictures. Ten years ago, they ditched the grind and moved into a barn in small town Maryland. In the time since, they've started two small presses. They've published more than 60 books. And they've had four kids. Now they're plotting a new adventure. They're getting ready to drive across the country in a school bus. Robbie and Matthew have made an unconventional life work over and over. Here's how they did it. Our goal was very modest. We did not want to publish our books. We did not expect to make money. We just wanted to make them. And to make sure that we did make them, we set ourselves the goal of making 10 that year in a subscription service. So we sent out a first book that we made called Facial Features of French Explorers to about 80 friends and family and said, hey, guys, if you give us $50, we'll send you nine more books this year. And when we say books, these are just like little zany chapbook kind of things. Yeah, they were tops like 30 pages. We thought they were going to be a lot less... Um, high production value than they were, though. Immediately, we got incredibly ambitious, yeah. and we made really much more sophisticated stuff than we thought we were going to. Not in terms of content, but in terms of the production work. Production value, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what happened after a year? You stayed? We did stay. Two yeah, things we, happened. Right. One, we didn't run out of money, so that was number one. And my boss from our company called me back, said, hey, we miss you. Would you like to have some arrangement where you can work from home on a half-time basis, keep having a predictable income, and have the time and space and energy to make your books? And that was everything. So we did not make money making books for the first 10 years of what we did, but we were able to support ourselves on my half-time salary, living modestly. And, I mean, this is one of the great secrets, I think, of success or happiness or fulfillment as a creative person is finding a way to liberate your creative product from whatever your bottom line is. And I know it's tricky and I don't want to be glib about it. We were really lucky that it turned out the way it did. But I'm able to do my work for the job in such a way that it doesn't cannibalize enough of my creative spirit and energy that we can have our cake and eat it too. And that's been everything as we've continued to build our work and our uh, awareness and the space of publishing. Well, I, I want to actually peel that yeah. apart a little bit. Um, as, as somebody who lives in a big city yeah. and would like to be creative, sometimes it can be difficult for me to imagine how I could make that work financially, right? right? And one of the decisions that you guys made was, we're going to go and start our family and raise our kids. And you have four of them, which we, we will get <laughs> into. But we did not have them at the outset. Yes. That's very important. If we'd yeah. had kids before we started this, we never would have done it. Yeah. Right. Interesting. We had to take that risk before we took that second plunge. Well, so you chose to go and live in a place that was extremely affordable. You're right. Yes. Probably not a place where your buddies from college lived. I mean, how did you decide where? Oh, where? Well, we decided it was because it was a free place to stay. My parents, it was my mom's pottery studio. It was a town that I grew up in, a small town on the eastern shore of Maryland. And um, I had grown up, it was my mom's pottery studio in the downstairs, and the upstairs was all storage of like... All manner of things. So, yes, I was always like, if if things go wrong, I can just, I'll just move into the barn. My parents love me. (laughs) Thank goodness. And they do. And I was always like, they'd be, they'd love to have me back. So, um, so that was why we chose, that was why we chose So there was a day when we were wandering around Baltimore and we said, we need to make a change. We need to figure it out. And and Robbie said, well, how about we go move into the barn? And And, make books for a year. And I was so struck by the possibility and promise that we got in the car. We got so excited. We drove to Robbie's parents' house that afternoon. Yeah. We told them our great plan and they gave us the most blank looks that we've (laughs) ever seen. They were supposed to reward us for our entrepreneurial spirit. Well, yes, they're entrepreneurs themselves. 
know. So I thought they were going to be like, this is great. I can't wait to see you guys like setting out on your own path. And they're like, you're moving home. Yeah. They were like, what are you? What? Robbie's mom came to America with a vision of what Americanness was. And one of the (laughs) things that defined an American man was having a grill. Um, second was having a job with benefits, and third was wearing some sort of uniform. Some sort of uniform. And her favorite uniform was kilt and bagpipes. Kilt and bagpipes. We don't know why that <laughs> so was necessary. Robbie's dad <laughs> fulfilled deal. none Did, of these requirements, none of those. Yeah. but I had fulfilled two out, two out of three. I owned a grill, yeah, and I had a job with benefits. Yeah. So the idea that we were sacrificing our job with benefits was hard for her to internalize. It they were a, they were supportive, but like did not. Did not give us a whole lot of enthusiasm. However, they supported us. They They said yes. They gave us the space. And we... So there was a long period of time when you were living in the barn. Yeah. And you were making your books and selling your subscriptions to these books. Mm -hmm. And you were not making a living doing that. You were, in fact, supplementing uh, a life. But you were actually making a living with this half-time day job. Yeah. Yeah. How did you keep up the creative spirit for that seven years, eight years in? Matthew's relentless, first of all. I am. Yeah. I think um, Matthew could probably produce 10 times as much if he weren't slowed down by the fact that I have to draw the pictures for what he makes. So, Um, so Matthew, you do the writing for the books. I do the writing, and Robbie does the illustration. And which comes first, the writing or the illustration? Almost always the writing. One time we did a book where Robbie did the illustrations first, and it was such a cataclysmic disaster. If anybody ever orders it off the website, we're like, sorry, guys. Oh, we're out of that. That that one's out. Sorry. Yeah. So it's a point of great so creative terrible. shame. Um, it's probably not as bad as we think. But it's terrible. It's, it's, it's terrible. It's no. okay. No, Robbie. It was an experiment. Robbie likes... I'm not asking the title on purpose don't. so that yes, we don't thank go you. into that. Thank you. Don't encourage anyone to buy that book. I want to speak for just a bit of time about sure. what it might have been like to be in the in the woods, per se, when you were making enough money, but you hadn't experienced any creative uh, economic success. Mm. The right. New York editors hadn't discovered you. Mm. And also, you were starting to have kids at this point mm-hmm. and probably thinking a little bit about how you might in the future. I don't know. Were you thinking about how Here's you pay for thing. college for them? Robbie is not a sensible person. No. so Robbie being you. Robbie <laughs> being me. It's not a sensible person. So, no. This whole, I think from the beginning, the idea of us making books together was never, someday we're going to be a big success and we're going to make tons of money doing this. We never thought that that was going to happen. Um, we knew that what we were doing was weird. And we learned very quickly that what we were doing was not, like, super economically viable. Um, Because at the beginning, we were making these strange pieces of social and political commentary, right? They were not They weren't very mainstream or commercial, right? So we started out knowing that. And we never set the goal for the books to be making money. Um, You know, I, I mean, growing up, my family, my dad was a a traveling interpreter. My mom was a potter. And then we spent our summers in Alaska commercial salmon fishing. So those were, that was how they cobbled together a life. And so my understanding of how you have a job and how you worry about um, a career, like a career to me doesn't, was never like a goal. It was just like make enough money to get through the day and part of that is also commercial salmon fishing. So, If we had set our goal yeah. to publish a series like The Real McCoys at the outset, and if we had had a single-minded focus to that, we believe we never would have succeeded. Yeah. And it's, The Real McCoys, by the way, is your, your children's book series. It yeah. is. Yes. It is a middle, middle grade is the technical term for elementary school students, mystery series. And it's densely illustrated. It's our version of what a graphic novel would be combined with a chapter book. It's called a hybrid book. So lots of illustrations and a real dance between the words and the images as you read. The only way that we got there eventually was by doing things that we loved, following the scent of opportunity, following the scent of creative uh, inspiration, and in a very roundabout way, finding ourselves in a place where we make these books that we feel very well suited to make and that we love. But I, I think there's a there's this fallacy where if you know your goal clearly, you are more likely to get it than if you just stick to what you love best on a daily basis, set attainable goals or set no goals, goals at all. This is terrible advice. Well, well I think it's worked it, for us. But it gets to like what a 
what a career goal should be in right. the first place. Right. And in the the sort of most straightforward way that we talk about it, a career goal is like the the job that you want and the money that you want. Mm-hmm. Right. But in in a more real way, a career goal is a way that you intend to feel about your work mm-hmm. when you fall into flow and you're doing the right work for mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. Right. And I don't know that you can know that right away. I don't think we did. Um, and in fact, it's interesting when you talk about how we made the leap from the self-publishing to the commercial publishing. It was a little bit of um, luck and it was a little bit of creating luck by being in the right place at the right time because we chose to put ourselves out there. We made books in the barn because we loved doing it. But then at a certain point, we said, we need to share these with the world. So we went to a show in Manhattan called the Museum of Comic and Cartoon Art Show, which is every April. It used to be in the Puck building downtown. I don't know where it is now. But a guy from Disney stopped by our table and bought one of our self-published books. And he kept it in his office for two years. And two years later, he took it to a production meeting where a woman named Erin Stein, who then worked at Little Brown, was trying to make a certain type of book, which was a mix-and-match book. It's a very novel format where panels flip and your narrative recombines in ways that still allow coherence of the story, right? So she had a specific type of book she needed made. Jesse said, I met these people. They were nice to work with. Jesse being the, the, the guy, guy who bought Disney. the book. Yeah. yeah. And that's how we connected for the first time with the commercial publishing world. We never pitched ourselves. We never tried to do that. There was this sort of happenstance, someone handing the right thing to the right person at the right time that led us. So they came to find you. Yeah. Yeah. We got an email one day saying, hey, we saw this book that you made. We're trying to make a book like that. You want to make a book like that with us? So do you feel like you got lucky? Oh, my gosh. Yes. But we had to be there at that show we had to show up at the show. We had to pack all our boxes, set up our booth, put the books out on the table for him to have come to the table and found the book. So in that way, we were lucky that he was the one who found it and that he held on to it and he thought of it when he went to that meeting. But we made the first piece of luck, which was him being able to find it, right? So from the start, we have sort of made sort of a mission of accepting every single opportunity when it came to these books, right, in part because we knew we didn't have to make money on them. The books paid for themselves because they were subscription-based. So, like, any time, you know, we did all kinds of crazy stuff. We painted murals. We um, we had a line of apparel. And, yeah. We produced four children's albums. We had a letter well, you press. We produced four children. We, we, produced, oh, we produced four, four children. children. That yeah. was, like, that was not part of the plan. We ran a letter press <laughs> studio for a couple yeah. of years. Um, we just, yeah, go ahead. I think, though, that when we talk about, well, you can do it, too, mm-hmm. you just have to be willing to, like, uh, tighten your belt and, you know, live on a little bit less, that that assumes a, a certain amount of privilege, and in part sure. because yes. people aren't willing always to do the things that are required to live on a little bit less. But like, tell us about your home. Tell us about the way that you lived. And it probably is a little bit different now that you have the successful book writing. It, it is and it isn't. <laughs> I think the thing that typifies it the most, at least for Robbie, is that in order to turn off the lights in one of the rooms in our house, you have to reach with a four-foot stick across a big pile of old <laughs> pottery stuff to toggle the switch on and off. Also, if you are in our bedroom, in order to get to the bathroom in the middle of the night, it takes about 90 seconds because you have to go up a flight of stairs, through a room, down another flight of stairs, through an unfinished portion of the barn, and into through a fire door. Like, I mean, it, this is it, something that Matthew finds troubling. I uh, think it's perfectly not fine. troubling. I think it's indicative. Most people probably wouldn't so, choose that as their bathroom situation. So the barn right? is basically we have one big room that is a kitchen, living room, dining room. Yeah, and. That was basic. And then we have a, a eight by nine by nine. Eight by eight room. Eight by eight room. That's a bedroom. Um, and that was how we started. We were only going to be there for a year. That was the plan. So we didn't have we didn't have a kitchen. We had like a little hot plate in the microwave and like a mini dorm fridge. And we were, that's how we lived for the first year. For the first couple years. For the first two years. And at a certain point, we said it might be nice to have children at some point. Right. Hey, Robbie's parents, wouldn't it be nice if we could use the other half of the hayloft? We could uh, maybe have a little more room to create children if you let us have that space, too. So, so then we finished the other half, and that's when we got the kitchen. So anyway, so we have one room that's kitchen, dining room, living room. The 8 by 8 room is where all four of the children sleep, and then the other side is the studio and our bedroom. 
Um, well, it doesn't sound like you have it bad at all. It sounds no, like you. Great. It sounds like you have opted into a very economical way to raise your family in space. Absolutely. Um, but there are sure a lot of fun things about the place you live in. Oh, there are. We have uh, playground equipment hanging from the beams in the living room. Yeah, that we our don't children... actually have a yard. No, but, so... but our, whenever kids come over, yes. they delight in the fact that you can do acrobatics in our living room and land on the couch and swing around. So, that yeah, there are certain things that that's our it, setup though. does. Those, those are the two. The, I'm, really, the only... I'm trying to focus on the good stuff, Rob. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful it old building. Beautiful it's an space. inspiring space. Well, we tell... live... Go ahead. It's a cute little town. It's a historic town. Um, it's on a river. Like, it's very charming. It's a small town, so 4,000 people, and everybody there knows us. So we have often said that if we had done this project, if we had decided to make books in New York or in Baltimore, like, it would have not been a story, right? But because we were doing it at this town, the whole town is behind us. Like, the local bookstore, like, one of our highlights, our peak highlights was when the local bookstore got one of our books and was like, we're going to we're going to carry your books. And that was like, oh, that was the best thing. And then... And then two weeks later, we had our first reading, which yeah. was nine people hunkered in the back of the two bookstore. Two of whom were my parents. But we felt like we had made it, It was Jessie. like, yeah, I it was fe- the best. I mean, just in terms of setting attainable goals, throughout right, yeah. our entire trajectory, it has always been taking great pleasure in the great thing that happened. Even if looking back on it now, that great thing seems small. We're taking a quick pause here. Coming up after the break, I'll talk to Robbie and Matthew about how exactly their crafty projects became mainstream kids' books. This episode of Hello Monday is brought to you by Delta. Delta flies to 300 cities. That's 300 cities where people sing in the car, poorly. 300 cities where people miss someone in one of the other 299 cities. And Delta isn't flying to those 300 cities merely to bring us together, but to show us we're not that far apart in the first place. Delta? keep climbing. And we're back with Robbie and Matthew. And I should add, they brought one of their kids. August joined us in the studio where he pulled his knees up on the floor against the wall and he listened so quietly until the very end. So when you started to have this new type of publishing success, when the New York uh, editors began calling you and you were doing different kinds of books, how did your life change? Well, we had to stop doing the subscription services. So the... the, um our two independent presses, we kind of had to shut down. I mean, we still sell the stuff, but we don't produce any more stuff for it. So the subscription services stopped. It was kind of a bummer because that was like absolutely 100% creative freedom. Um, but, you know, the trade-off now is that we don't have to do our we don't have to do our own marketing. Like, we just get to do the creative stuff and everything else is handled by the publishers. And to me, especially, the joy of working with an editor. Um, Robbie is a great editor. She has Thanks. always been there to oh, be my first line <laughs> of feedback and to let me know if something is working or not. But getting to work with professional editors and to grow as a writer and to start writing longer form stuff. And it's the grad school I never had. I mean, that's really what I feel like. It is the chance to learn and grow as an author with every book. It's a joy. I I love this. I love this. Well, it does make me think you're raising a family together and you are working on your most important project, which also happens to be mostly your day jobs together. How do you make that work? I mean, luckily, we agree on about 95 percent of everything and we spend about 95 percent of our time together. And I think that sometimes we lose sight of that because that last 5 percent sometimes is a real... We we have a very shared vision for parenting, thank goodness. Yes. Very intuitively. We don't disagree very often. We just have a common way of looking at it, which is a great lucky thing. We have a very, very similar aesthetic for what we think is beautiful, interesting. We are both equally committed to the quality of our work. So, so certain things that bind us are intensely um, foundationally compatible. The thing that is different Ugh. is a lot. Um, I am <laughs> driven. I am uh, hard, hard charging. Um, I am a hummingbird. Robbie is a bear. Robbie would yeah. like to spend her days lying on the back in a pool looking up at the butterfly in her nose. Yeah, yeah. So the two of us together create this thing that either one of us, I would just burn up in a, a heaping flame of ash, right? And Robbie would probably still be working on... I would be working on book one right. at this point. The strengths of our collaboration are the the similarities in our approach, but the real power of it comes in the differences. Um, it is why we can get as much done as we can get done. I am a slow and steady details person, um, and Matthew is goal-oriented and, like, pushes things through to get them done. So anything that needs a lot of energy and speed, 
that turns out to be Matthew's job. And anything that needs, like, actually to have careful attention paid to details, that's my job. How do you balance child care? What does it mean to each of you to be a working parent? Oh, so we ignore them a lot of the time. Luck- <laughs> Luckily, <laughs> the kids are um, pretty self-sufficient. They have each other. They're very creative kids. They are very imaginative kids. Um, it kind of depends on who's busy at a given time. If I'm working on the draft of a novel, Robbie's going to be more in the driver's seat on the parenting front. Right now, she's working on illustrating a new book series we're working on. And so I'm doing the lion's share of that. So we switch off. One of the things that I think is indispensable if you're going to be a creative person trying to build a life around it, is having some sort of ongoing support service, some sort of deeply empathetic someone to turn to who can lift you up and give you perspective at those moments when all is dark. Well, luckily, strangely enough, for us, it's each other. Yeah. And for whatever reason, we are like sort of the rhythm of our creative lives is that if Matthew is down, I am up. And if I'm down, Matthew's up. And so without somehow— Without fail, Jesse. Without, yes. We so, I don't know, have bad days at the same yeah, time ever. Ever. How do you do that? It I is, don't know. M- it is mystical. Yeah. And it is a big part of why it works. Yes. Is I almost sometimes, if I see Robbie's having a bad day, I'm like, all right, this is going to yeah, be a good day for me. It's going to be okay. But we'll, we, yeah. we lift each other up. Yeah. You need someone to carry the flame on yeah. any given day. So you have the real McCoys. Mm-hmm. You have this new book series that you're working on that will come out with Two big books next spring. Mm-hmm. Yes. And you're also getting ready for, okay, this is my read on it, but kind of a crazy <laughs> year where you're going to yes. essentially live in a school bus. Yes. Not essentially, actually. Actually yes. live in a school bus. Yeah. So this has kind of been a dream of ours for a long time and it's finally, we're finally making it happen. So the idea is that we were going to, we ha- we bought a school bus. A 24-foot schoolie. A sort of mini school yes, bus. Like How a, does one buy a school bus? It's oh. crazy. You just go online and there's... <laughs> there are forums. Yeah. And there's lots can, of questions and videos. Yeah. This is a whole subculture. Yeah. We are not your typical demographic for the subculture. We're sort of uh, interlopers. We're yeah, yeah. In the okay. subculture. But we have a guy who's fascinated and game to do the renovation, who's yeah. all all in on the research. And when you say do the renovation, trick the school bus out so you can live yes, in it. Exactly. He's going to put a second story on the school bus, Jesse, so the children have a place well, like to sleep. Like a little pop-up tent. Yeah. Is yeah. it going to be bigger than the barn? No, no. no. It's a very small school bus. <laughs> it, it, I think one would reasonably acquire a larger school bus for all these people. But I don't want to drive around a giant school bus. No, no, So it's just a not. mini school bus. So the plan is we are going to spend the 10 months of an academic year covering all states in the lower 48 visiting schools serving high-poverty communities in all 50 states, giving away at least, hopefully, 25,000 books and hopefully a lot more if we can raise more. And while we're going, also try to inspire philanthropy by getting people invested in giving to the schools that we are visiting in other ways, buying classroom supplies, buying playground equipment, trying to just build an awareness of the profound need in our nation's public schools, the profound inequity. I just think people don't know how much in their own communities right. there are schools. It's a local problem as well as a national problem. So, um, so yeah, the plan is that we're going to travel the whole United States doing that for a year. And, so, and then, then go oh, to Alaska. And then go to Alaska. And do our fishing. Right. And which you do every summer. Which we do every Correct. summer. Yeah. So, um, so this is really a, a project that's going to start a year and a half from now. Yes. And you're already planning it. You already have the school bus. You're so certain that it will happen, even though you don't quite have the money for it yet. This is how and we you, do everything. Didn't you, Robbie say something about Robbie's Ridiculous earlier? <laughs> yes. um, again, I'm sort of riding on Robbie's belief in us and in the mission. I have gotten infected with Robbie's way of thinking things. I just things. sometimes believe things. Yeah. And, and you'll have at the time an eighth grader, a sixth grader, a fourth grader, and then a smaller and a person. a four-year-old, yeah. yes. Nice work. Uh, so, uh, thank you. Yeah. So, um, so they're all going to come along? Like, What are they, what are they yeah. going to do for the year? Yes. Well, they're going to be homeschooled in the very <laughs> loosest sense of the term. They're going to have the ultimate field trip. Yeah. They're going to visit yeah. all the states, so many state parks, major cities, small towns, off the beaten track wonders. They're going to see— They're all used to—we we sometimes schlep them along on our school visits mm-hmm. when we do school visits now. So they're used to that part of things. Right. They're used to seeing us presenting and sort of having to sit in a corner quietly and behave themselves. Um but uh, ideally, the rest of the trip is going to be a big discovery trip, like a lot of really cool stuff that we can see and learn. As you're talking about what it means to live a creative life, you know, so often you have these conversations with people who have already like, made it. And it's really interesting to catch up with you in 
the middle of this journey somehow and to hear that as much as you trusted that the last decade and change would work out, you're also trusting that the future is just going to work out. Well, here's the thing. I mean, people always talk about, oh, this is it's such a risk to quit your jobs and to go off and make books in a barn, right? Um, It seems so risky. And we talk about risk a lot with kids. And it's an important distinction to make between what is an actual risk and what is just feels risky, what is a little scary, right? Um, I honestly believe that we have never taken a real risk. Because if everything blew up, I knew that we're both capable, we both would be able to find something that could pay the bills. So that is a that is a privilege to be able to think like that. But I also think that not taking the risk to say, oh, it feels a little scary, so I don't think that we should do it because um, we don't know what's going to happen. Like, that's kind of spinning that privilege in the eye, I feel like. If you have the opportunity to do this thing, to take something that seems like a risk but isn't risky at all because you can always backpedal from it, then why not? Why not try the thing and see how it goes? Because if we hadn't tried it, look, this is the past 10 years have been something that neither of us could have even imagined. Many of our listeners may be thinking about projects like this that they might want to do at some point in the future. So if you know, if you knew then... In 2006, what you know now, what would you advise yourself? If we knew how much work it was going (laughs) to be, we never, ever would have done it. I think we've had absolute blinders on to the effort. And I think the number one thing that you need if you're going to live a life like this is an absolute willingness to doggedly work for it. And therefore, a corresponding essential love of the thing itself. It has to be its own end because the toil is endless. I mean, we we I love what we get to do in our lives. I think we make our lives look really fun on social media and when we talk and about they it. Are really they fun. are, but boy, but is it a lot, a lot of work. work. It's yeah. a lot of work. The other things I would say, very simple advice, but we talked about luck earlier. Luck is something that you can manufacture. Okay. Luck is not purely happenstance. We have made our own luck through, I think, a couple of things, one of which is the willingness to work hard, but one of which is treating people well along the way. One of our favorite things to do is make people look good who take an, a risk on us, who, who take a chance on us. We love it. Whenever anyone gives us an opportunity, we want to deliver on that opportunity 500%. Don't be an asshole. Don't be an asshole. Yeah. Okay? I mean, you deal with humans in whatever you do. And coming to whatever work you do with open-heartedness and generosity creates luck in the aftermath. So I think that's part of what I would say is you're going to work really hard. Be good to the people who give you opportunities. And um, try everything along the way. Thank you. You're welcome. Awesome. Again, that was Robbie Baer and Matthew Swanson. Their new book series, Cookie Chronicles, will be published by Not Books for Young Readers in the spring of 2021. And that brings us to a question for you, listeners. What's the one thing that you would do if you could quit your job and start all over tomorrow? I'm talking no limitations. Write to me at hellomonday at linkedin.com or post on LinkedIn using the hashtag hellomonday. I'm really psyched to share some of your stories on an upcoming show. And now that we're back in production, you can help us. Please rate us on Apple Podcasts. It takes two seconds and it helps new listeners find the show. Hello Monday is a production of LinkedIn. The show is produced by Sarah Storm with help from Madison Schaefer. Joe DeGiorgi mixed our show. Florencia Iriando is head of original audio and video. Dave Pond is our technical director. Maya Mangini and Victoria Taylor make the wheels on the bus go round and round. Our music was composed, just for us, by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. You also heard music from Poddington Bear. Dan Roth is the editor-in-chief of LinkedIn. I'm Jesse Hempel. See you next Monday. Thanks for listening. August, at one point in your life, you told me that you wanted your job to be the person who hugs other people when they needed hugs. Is that still your life's ambition? Or have you thought of anything else that you'd like to do at this point? That's probably not what I'm going to do, yeah. but um, I still probably am going to give people hugs if yeah. they need a hug. What would you like to do for the rest of your time? I would like to be a video game designer. Nice. Ah. Nice. Well, one thing is you could have a lot of jobs. Like you could be a fisherman, game designer, hug giver, <laughs> zookeeper. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Except that zookeeper will be about 
a 1.0% chance I'm going to be that. Okay. Oh, man. Well, Jess, Jesse's just trying to throw out the options. Just, but, yeah, just however want a lot of options. Yeah. Want a lot of options. Uh, well, thank you very much.